Marketing report so we can share this with some of our colleagues. I can't advance my screen. There we go. So what are they? Well, basically a gravel beach. All, all beaches can be dynamic in their in their uh, behavior and uh, in, an, in some sort of a dynamic equilibrium state where they change shape, but uh, over a long time. And the key is that they adjust to storm waves. The reason they're better than riprap and seawalls is they do not cause erosion to the neighbor's proper, property and they help restore lake ecology and improve water quality. How do we change our lakeshore regulations? Um, I think we need to adopt them as the preferred alternative. You know, we need to say, can we build a beach and help restore the lake rather than put in a seawall and a riprap? Why is it mandatory to have a, a, a seawall? Um, I've developed this gravel beach design template and it's a engineering approach to coming up with the metrics that you need to uh, build a beach. We need to eliminate the variance requirement so that uh, we can just follow a, a, a steadfast process. And beaches aren't made of marbles. They, they, they have sand and silt and everything composed in it. Maybe the top surface is all clean, smooth, well-sorted gravels, but the whole beach itself is like a gravel bar in a river. If you dig down in the, on a beach or dig down in a gravel bar in a river, you'll see that there's matrixes full of sand and silts, and that helps stabilize the beach and, and uh, add to uh, other biological processes. So there's a dynamic equilibrium beach. When I used to teach lakeshore ecology, uh, <coughs> landscape ecology at the biological station, I'd go over to Wild Horse Island to this beach. This beach has been uh, stable in a dynamic fashion since the dam went in in 1938. There's another one over by Rollins. You can see it has a little different wave climate, smaller gravels <clears throat> and uh, not as wide, not as big. There's another one on the East shore, similar. This is Boucher Park in Folsom Bay and uh, all the wood and everything gets cleaned up and we got lawn and a uh, gravel beach. Here's another natural gravel beach. This is in the biological station and it used to have a, a lawn on it, but uh, the director there went and added a uh, riparian buffer. And so this is really the example of what Flathead Lake needs to uh, help restore what it has lost. This is uh, uh, the north shore of the lake. And um, Randy, this is what two inch uh, screen gravel looks like after a year of, of wave action. Is that possible? This is, uh, no, right at, near the river mouth. Okay. And this is about halfway between Osprey and the river mouth. Um, it's two inch screen gravel. So it's basically lots of sand, sealed. you can still see some of the sand in the original deposit there put down. And notice all the wood. Okay, that's another big component in beaches is um, cleaning up and getting rid of all the wood because it looks uh, unsightly to some people isn't the best thing ecologically. Speaking of a nice clean beach, <laughs> this is the beach we built last year in uh, Lakeside uh, Volunteer Park. Uh, this was a huge beach. It's probably the most uh, material per foot uh, on the lake. Uh, because it has to have the capacity to facilitate lots of people. It's a public park. And uh, so I think it's an appropriate use. Uh, lots of people love to go there. I love to go there and watch people just swim. Nothing does my heart more good than that. <clears throat> I'm sure most of you have seen this picture. This is the biggest storm on Flathead Lake that I know of in the last 50 years that I've been here. That's yeah, that's a raven. It's a 1998 Halloween storm. And you can see the wave hitting a seawall in front of the raven. Uh, at the time, it was throwing rocks the size of your fist over the raven and onto the, onto the highway there. But also notice the, the breaking wave next to it. And so you can see the swash of the wave before it. So it's a beautiful contrast of how beaches deal with wave energy and how seawalls deal with it. 
unfortunately, this is what it looks like now. Um, we had a house built on what used to be a beach, a rock seawall. Then one landowner that uh, didn't put anything in, then another landowner that went the riprap approach. And that yellow arrow is, is showing you the direction of gravel transport. So this site is receiving a lot of gravel and um, that's why there's still a beach persisting with all the wave reflection that occurs in this, in this area. So just to give you a little idea, we kind of used to need to step back um, before the dam went in and whitefish and swan lake operate this way. We have a, a base level uh, that is during most of the year. And then when the rivers flood, the lakes go up with that flood rise and back down again. And you get erosion along with this varial zone if there's a coincident storm occurring. But all of, most of the wave energy is, is down at that low base, base level. The problem in Whitefish Lake and Swan Lake and some of the others is everybody's moving into that buffer strip area and building houses. And they have in the past. And so there's now seawalls and riprap and things going on there that um, are causing problems because when the lake level does come up and you have a seawall and there is big waves, it's going to start causing erosion and reflection and scour around. So we need to find solutions for those lakes as well. It's actually quite easy, a lot more easy than the flathead lake. So flathead, it, it, uh, it concentrates because it's regulated now and held at a full pool elevation. It's actually above its, its mean annual level, uh, it concentrates all that wave energy at that level and, and causes pretty severe erosion. The question is, is there enough material, gravel material, to stay on the beach, to make a beach, then to protect this new footprint shoreline? So if we go around the lake and look at a place like this, uh, when the bank is mainly sand, like we see here, and right about uh, Paul Fomar's head. And he just happens to be the world leader on the planet in beach processes and sedimentation. Paul, Paul Fomar was my advisor for my graduate work. Um, so now only a small percentage of that material that lands on the beach ends up creating a beach to protect the back shore. This is over on Wild Horse Island. And you can imagine it's probably 30, 50 feet of eroded bank that's gone in to produce a little bit of gravel in the sea right there. This is Yellow Bay State Park. Uh, when I was a little kid, I could ride my bike on there. It was campground in this area. And as it started eroding, people would be pushing, like my neighbor Lyle Tinsville did most of this work, would push these rocks up for riprap, and then it would continue to erode behind it and continue to erode. So they just keep pushing, keep pushing the rocks back. It's not a properly built riprap. Here's one that's properly built. Um, the red dotted line uh, shows you where full pool would be. Um, you have a re nice riparian buffer, riprap, and then the lake. So in the summertime, this is not very conducive to uh, recreation, to go and swimming. This is another one. This, uh, beach is actually near and dear to my heart. My little boy used to walk down the, the beach and play with my neighbors that owned this place. And there was a huge beach there. And they sold and somebody came down. The first thing they did was they built, they put in riprap. Um, there wasn't any erosion. And now they've lost the beach. This was a, a, a riprap put in over by Rollins uh, last year. All the recurring vegetation was removed and uh, riprap stone. So this is what I'd like to see discouraged. So this was actually what was planned for the North Shore. It's a seawall plus riprap. Um, so this is, isn't going anywhere. It will be there forever. And it's used all over. This is the uh, Fish and Wildlife Park there on um, Finley Point. And it's a gorgeous place for a beach. This is where we need to do a beach next morning. Wow. If we could take out all of that riffraff, take that seawall out, then all the visitors there would have a nice place to go swimming. But there's no place to swim at this park. Yeah. 
and spreading your towel out is a little rough <laughs> on the rip route. So this is kind of the situation in, in Flathead Lake. We have an eroded shoreline. We're putting rip wraps and sea walls, properly building them and backfilling. We're putting in lawns and fertilizing that those nutrients end up getting back into the lake. Because sea walls and rip wrap reflect so much energy, waves back out into the lake, they meet with the waves coming in, called the incident wave, and that combines to increase the wave height power of the waves to be worked, like scour, goes as the square of wave height. So we're exponentially increasing the erosion right at the toe of these structures and across the armored lake bed. And we lose all the riparian buffer, we lose all the aquatic uh, plants that can grow out there, and we're left with just parapite that can hang onto the rocks. <clears throat> Here's a, an example of a client that wanted to take out the riprap and put in a beach. And he was also concerned with the algae that was growing there and wanted to know what to do about that. And I said, well, quit fertilizing your lawn and making that connection. He says, but it's so green, I love the green, you know? Well, that's why you have so much algae growing there. And it's why when you go swimming, you all get swimmer's edge. So this is the solution that I gave him because he did not want to take out the seawall. I said, let's build a beach. Here's a north proposed, it'll work here. Here's the south proposed. You can move your dock down and let some flow through there. And I took this plan, went and talked to the Flathead uh, County planners at the time, and they told me this wasn't permittable. And, and I went back and told the client uh, what the potential problem uh, would be, and he didn't want to do it. So we kept, it's just the way it is right now. So there's a, this whole public meetings and variance and having to go through variance is, is a big barrier for beaches to a lot of clients. This is the, uh, um, I wish I could get rid of the writing there, but gravel beaches dissipate their energy through wave break. And that allows aquatic plants and insects to return to this near shore environment. Um, you want to go to the Oh, I'm running out of juice. <laughs> On the right is a uh, REU student that looked at this beach, and those are all counts per per effort uh, per minute of um, aquatic insects. And the, most of them are in the back part of that beach where there's actually some uh, some water. This is a gravel spit, and then the A portion is the the front side. But what it's full of is prominids and, and mayflies. And they, part of their life cycle is they lay eggs and the, and the larvae then work their way through the, the interstitial spaces in the gravel and, and feed on uh, what's growing down there. And the matrix of the beach is really important to the ecology of the lake. And that's why making everything out of washed drain rock is uh, not, probably not the best idea. Okay, here's a, a shot. You can see that little, it's about 100 feet of rip wrap That was put in, and this is in Lake County, and the neighbor's property lost in a tremendous amount of beach in one focal season. And here, here's kind of what happens. It's, and this, this is when you get waves coming straight on to a, uh, like in Woods Bay and other places, to a, a, a structure, be it a rip wrap or a sea it caused erosion on either side of it, actually, um, up to 70% of its length. Well, I noticed in the regulations now you're trying to move the seawalls 10 feet down, but if you build a 100-foot seawall, you're still going to have 60 feet of, of erosion to the neighbors. There's just uh, nothing you can really do about that. Are seawalls yeah. Oh. Yeah, seawalls under that. Mm -hmm. And this is just a, you know, this in the late 90s was a big deal in coastal engineering. There were lots of publications. And McDougall and all uh, have, did most of that. And Bill McDougall was, uh, was my minor advisor. And there's even textbooks out that uh, talk about this scouring. And, and so it's not, it's nothing new. Um, 
but it's well documented. Not something I'm making up is all I'm really trying to say. But if waves are coming in at an angle, you don't have to have a really long seawall. You can have just a, jo a, a groin or a jetty going straight out. And that can cause erosion on the inside. Really nice example of that is in Yellow Bay. All the transport is to the left in this stream, which is to the north. And this old crib dock has stopped all of the erosion on the updrift side, created nice beaches and eliminated because the waves are still there. The power, the ability to do the work is still there. What we're missing is the supply of gravel. So this is the first uh, gravel beach that I ever built and designed and published in this uh, civil engineer uh, journal. And at the time they were referred to as perched gravel beaches because we couldn't lower the lake level. So we had to raise the, the bed up and that's still the situation we are in. And uh, Lake County was the leader in this. Uh, Nancy and Jerry, I met with them and they said, yeah, we gotta give this a try. And it was fantastic. So we gave it a try. And uh, you can see on the left there, that dark gray area, that's where all the erosion was, was occurring. And the little uh, boxes with the X's is the seawall. It was a log seawall and it was uh, filled with boulders. This is what that beach looked like uh, the first summer in 1988. And this is what it looks like in 2018. All the logs have rotted away, and now the, the owner of this property is doing the same thing, pushing the boulders back up to stop the erosion that's occurring on, on his lake front. And this is what that dynamic equilibrium beach looks like after 40 years. So what happens on this beach is waves break and squash, form a beach crest, and then the backwash comes back and meet, meets the next wave breaker. And that's where a step forms. And they, uh, you can give it just a loose, uh, all the waves, just a mixture of gravel and all the big round will end up down by the step and across that flat plateau zone. And then the smaller gravels end up being on top of the beach crest. And you can see that here where the step is and the plunge zone and the various beach ridges that are made from different storm events. And how do they, uh, they work? Well, they dynamically adjust by uh, pushing forward through the plunging uh, action of waves and the upwash trading crests. And after each storm that they adjust, they actually get stronger, if you will, more resilient to the next storm. So it takes a bigger storm and a bigger storm. So the key is to figure out how wide to make it so you're not back into an erosion problem. And this is the same beach, and it's probably the second biggest storm that I've ever seen on Flathead Lake. And I was lucky enough to get some video. Well, this is what we're trying to do with these dynamic equilibrium beaches is to force the wave breaking far enough offshore that it doesn't hit the back shore and cause erosion. Now this is looking south. I just turn around the dock and look north and we'll look at the riprap. Here's the riprap shoreline. <laughs> So it's not surprising that people want to use big boulders for riprap and build concrete seawalls to, to be strong enough to hold back all those forces. It just makes sense from a human perspective. But what's hard to, to understand is that if, if we let the beach dissipate its wave energy through wave breaking, you can get the same result, plus have a recreational beach, plus support the uh, ecology of the lake.
So this is uh, on the uh, uh, Blue Bay Campground, the 2005, the tribe said, will you design a beach for us? And we did, it was completely eroding away, trees falling in. Uh, you couldn't, there wasn't enough gravel in the eroding bank to create a beach there. So we created a beach and it still looks very much like that. And their campsites are behind there. It's just beautiful. You can walk out onto the beach. I go down there all the time and watch people enjoy it. And this is essentially how it was constructed. We did two layers, an outer layer to break the waves and an upper layer to make the, the, the beach. And you can see how the waves now are breaking further offshore. Um, and this is uh, what was the Matson property at the time is now the Osprey um, uh, Landing beach and there's so much wood and peat there that every time the lake overwashes and flows into the into the marsh is what we were trying to maintain it brings with it more peat and more and more logs so the gravel is still out in front and there's so much peat now that the vegetation is growing up through it but it still overwashes and overtops because we get big sashes in the lake that elevate the lake level by a foot up against this beach this is exactly what uh, some of Look like except for section one. It's going to be a big one. And there's not so much material in the lawn. Oh, sure, you're right. Okay. I don't know about section one now. Here's another beach in um, uh, Folsom Bay, and they don't have to all be straight to take home value on this one. They can be curved and uh, kind of create the or maintain the existing topography there. So that's all the right Yep. Delivering the white. Yep, all the white, yeah. And then here's the demo project on the on the uh, biological station that we did. Was it two years ago now? Yeah. And it's seen some pretty big waves. Um, this is a smaller wave. And what we try to do, what I do when I design beaches, is figure out how big the waves will be, how far deep into that uh, breaking the plunge zone will exist, because the waves are just going to pound on it and push the gravel forward. And then how far will it run up till it's fully dissipated? This is a two foot wave with a 25 foot dissipation distance. And I'm showing this because I put this all into mathematical equations now so that you can uh, read graphs and design beaches. So how do we change our regulations? Well, we have, I believe, adapt and require the gravel design beach template. The first part of it allows one to demonstrate how severe the erosion problem is. Remember the first two slides, we looked at uh, the big gravel beach with large rock on Wild Horse, and then the one in Rollins was small, two different natural gravel beaches. So they don't all have to be big cobbles. It can be pea gravel and, and sand out to it, or oyster, oyster shells, or oysters. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole gravel beach template is to do exactly what this uh, uh, little diagram is, is supposed to be showing. How do we move the waves further offshore and maintain a gravel beach? How much material do we need? How, how thick does it need to be? And what grain size distribution do we need? So here, here's a, a template uh, for this uh, design. And everything in red is something that comes out of a calculation. The, bar, the lake bed profile is your survey line. And so as long as you have enough room between the bottom of the toe of that structure and out to the little pool, you can build a beach. In some places, there's not enough room, like on the Yellow Bay Point. We couldn't build a beach there to save some uh, cottonwood, I mean, some uh, ponderosa pine. So we had to use some boulders at the bottom to perch everything up. So when you don't have enough room, then you have to go to uh, basically a cobble or boulder beach. And I've put this all now into some graphs. So if we look at this, this is all you need to know, really, to design a gravel beach on Flathead Lake. And along the bottom is your wind speed going up to 50 miles an hour on the far end. And then your, your variable, your, break, your design breaker wave height. Well, you need to know that to get to your wave breaker depth. And along the, those lines, I suppose, are the fetch distance. So at your site, how far can the wind blow across to make a wave? And it goes up to 50 kilometers, I believe, on here. 
uh, 25 kilometers. So that pretty much covers uh, all of Flathead Lake with, these, with this diagram. We can see that if we want to design for severe wind event, a wind event which is on the far side there, and the wind speed's 45 miles an hour in about two hours, that's hit its maximum. It can't, the waves can't get any bigger. You see, we need 45 feet to totally dissipate that wave. But a storm event, more common, you know, we see 30 mile an hour, 25 mile an hour winds quite often. They're going to produce, you know, three foot waves, two foot, 2.8 foot breaking distance, and uh, 27 feet of uh, dissipation distance. And the plunge zone distances, that's going to tell you when you make your layers how far apart they need to be. So with these diagrams, pretty much anybody, you don't need to have, be a mathematician or a coastal engineer. Uh, you can work through it here and find out what you want to design for. And if you go towards designing towards severe events, it's more material and more costs. I just put this up here because uh, it just shows what kind of uh, equations go into this. Uh, the Hudson equation is the Army Corps of Engineers Shore Protection Manual. And they basically say the mass of the stone, which is MS, goes as the cube of offshore wave height. Uh, cotangent theta, theta is the angle between the beach and the water. Um, and then my equations are quite similar, but I use the breaking wave heights and the run up velocities on the beach, the velocities of the waves approaching, the friction of the beach, the slope of the beach, not just the cotangent theta, and uh, the KR and KD are, are fitting coefficients. How well do rocks fit together? So if you use angular rocks, you can use actually smaller rocks. Smooth rocks like the roll, so you need bigger rocks or a distribution of those. And this is a plot of that. So everything in blue, that attainment threshold, this is for, uh, it goes up to 50 kilometers for Flathead Lake and, and bigger. That's rock sizes. If you look on the, on the, on the uh, Y axis there, it's the intermediate diameter of the rock. So it's basically, you know, rocks up to eight inches in diameter and you're really active on the beach through that range up to 50 miles an hour in wind speed. The Hudson formula is the gray one on the, on the top and the Lorang static equation. Yes, I wrote an equation to say how to build a riprap. <laughs> it requires quite smaller, because sometimes you need them, rocks and what the Hudson formula uses. And then there's a range of overlap there. And this is just looking for a flathead lake. And how I use this graph and the math is behind it, is I use my severe events to build the bottom cobble layer. I want that layer to withstand wave breaking against it so that the beach doesn't unravel and wash away. Typically why they do wash away. Gravel and, and pebbles make up the middle layer and then the very top layer it only sees the, up, the final uprush of the wave. And so they can be really small events, a really small gravel. So this is kind of in generically what comes out of it. You've got a, a eroding profile, that's the black line. Here are the three layers. You can see where waves would break and severe storm would dissipate all the way to the top of this particular beach. And the, the normal storm waves that you see every year, you know, they're gonna break right up that breaking point there. That's how far to bring that bottom layer up. And they'll swash up into that upper layer as well. So this is one for Polson Bay, and that's a 10 kilometer line. And it's you know almost four feet for a breaking height, breaking depth three feet. So those are big waves for Polson Bay. Um, and we had a huge storm, so they can get to four feet the breakers in this bay. Yeah, it's it's almost well, funny you bring that up because I got a picture of people surfing the flat. <laughs> so with Polson Bay, you can here's kind of the the range from you know a little over an uh, inch and a half to three inch and a half is gonna make be your base layer. Uh, it'll be mobile, but only very, you know, pretty much big storm events and severe events. Then the middle layer can be smaller material and of course very small material for the top layer. So here's a, an actual uh, client's project. And the very top one, we plot these onto the profile that exists there. And you can see how far in 
that would have to erode before it would stop eroding. And so this area needs to erode another six to eight feet. And that's a pretty good objective mathematical way to quantify how bad your erosion is. And what we want to do now is move that offshore. And if we move it offshore to right to where the 2893 intersects, that would be like the minimum. So that's, that's having a lot of faith in my equations. <laughs> I would move it a bit more offshore. And that's what we did here. We said, well, this is what came out of it, um, these, these three layers. I got another example. Here's one uh, that has riprap and they want a beach. And you can see that if there wouldn't, it wasn't riprap there, this would be a really severe erosion. That's why these people built riprap. But what they want is a beach. And so I said, well, how wide do you want your beach to be? Well, they said, we'd like to have at least 12 feet so we can be out there on a storm, watch it happen. And so, okay, we can do a 12 foot beach. That then creates your perched profile. Can we see how that works? And then that's what it looks like uh, with filling in with the various uh, uh, material with the little red dotted line showing how big storms would make a ridge. And I encouraged them and they were all over it. Let's bury that rip wrap or take it. They didn't want to take it out. They wanted to leave it because it's security. It's a point. Let's bury it and let's plant uh, material. And this is what I think you can do. In in whitefish, this, this is like the solution for whitefish as well. And it could be much smaller because your waves are only gonna be it's old so infrequent and so much smaller. So we could dial in that design beach uh, for Swan Lake and for uh, Whitefish Lake, all, all, all the lakes that are unregulated. This is another client um, that had an erosion looking north. That's the picture, there's a big riprap there. And this is what the beach would look like at a minimal state uh, for them. And then looking south, there's another big riprap you can see in that little indentation there. And they wanted to leave that riprap because they wanted to dock. And so this is a way to kind of find a compromise between the docks and the riprap. We could build a beach here, put a wall on that dock, and leave the other one open so that you could actually get a boat in there and it wouldn't fill in and, and uh, defeat their purpose of having a boat. And I was, I've had them put a trying around in there, so I was encouraging them to <laughs> get a sailboat. <laughs> and it wasn't deep enough for a keel. And this is what it looks like on, on scale. So you can see looking down in plan view. These little gravel spits in here, if you remember the, doc, uh, the picture I showed with the uh, very aquatic, uh, various aquatic insects. You, you build one of these and you're just gonna have, there are little ecological hotspots. And it's a way to compartmentalize um, within prop, property boundaries. Because we have, you know, ways don't know who owns what. I guess I took the safety questions out. Oh, out. Right. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's my story. And you do the same on ocean beaches since we got an extra yeah. element in there for tide. Yeah, it's it's a little more uh, I wouldn't say it's easier. Flathead Lake is a lot more lake energy. We will yes, yeah, so like I just did this work in, in San Francisco Bay and I used Flathead Lake as an example um, because they want to know well what will it look like in 30 years? Well, because of one regular it'd be like holding high tide for you know, all year. So tides go up and down, tides go up and down. And if you don't have a wind event, then everything gets wet, but nothing really washes away. Right. So um, it's more complicated on one end, but you got less energy to deal with. Yeah. So Mark, can, can you go over again how this applies to a small section of shoreline? So if one Landowner wants to do a gravel beach, but the neighbors don't necessarily want to do. How would you, how would you implement that kind of a design? That's what that was kind of trying to show. But to the neighbor to the north is a big, huge, it's one of the largest seawalls on the lake, and it's and it's recurve like this too. So it really puts. Uh, that's why there's so much erosion on this property, and so we can contain that whole beach with that dock and that spit. That is, I, I don't know where off the top of my head, but about 100 feet of shoreline. 
it's not that, that big. And then of course to the south end, they wanted to be able to come in their dock and there's already riprap in there. Um, so we're gonna leave the riprap and put gravel on top of it and revegetate it. Get right, some, some buffer. So, so a spit, a spit is the requirement to sort of keep that gravel on the land owner's property. Yeah. Uh, one of yeah. the gravel rather than have the gravel drip over the years onto our neighbor's property. Right. Right. And so the spit on the south end is the dock. Yeah. Um, spits do other things as well. They, uh, they ra radiate the energy out. So it'd be like if you, you know, drop the pebble in, the, in a pond and you see how everything radiates out, and the waves get smaller and smaller and smaller to blow out. It's a way to dissipate the wave energy as opposed to just reflecting it out. And we can also make that outer side so it's not vertical, so it's on a slope so we can cause wave break. So on the outer, outer spit, we can dissipate 50, 60% of the wave energy and then radiate the rest of it out and have it spread and be pretty much go to nothing. Because we don't want to make our inner, inner embayment the right away, right? So, um, and that's where that radiation would go. It'd go back up to the seawall and back in front of this, this beach here. The other thing is, is that little tiny, and I, I love to work with wood. I would put root wads and all sorts of things in that spit um, when I find clients that are into that. Because when you put a root wad and logs in the, in the ground, you all of a sudden have so many aquatic insects and juvenile fish of all varieties. It's really the, the solution. And this is what Yellow Bay will look like in the first. <laughs> So um, can, you, can you also talk a little bit about costs? I think that there are people who would look at this kind of design and imagine the number of cubic yards of gravel and say, oh, God, um, I'm sure I can put in a riprap um, beach cheap. Yes. Um, and, and, and maybe you can talk about two steps there. There's the initial costs. And, and then there are the long-term costs of maybe restacking the, the riprap or adding more gravel and, and also that intrinsic uh, cost or benefit of, to the environment. Yes, that's a, that's a really good question, Steve, and you framed it perfectly. Okay, so the volume of material for a gravel beach is more than the volume of material you need for riprap. So the what it costs for that material sitting in the pit, the riprap material is cheaper. Okay? Then the costs become how to get it to some site, and what are the what are the logistics with bringing boulders versus gravel to a site? Um, so those are you know, how far away you are from the pit and whatnot. But what's not added into that cost is how much acreage you need to mine to get enough boulders to make a riprap. And so I was at the uh, Wooden Bay gravel pit that I use a lot and asked them how much, you know, here's all those oversized boulders that people would use for riprap. And I asked them how much uh, land it took to get that and said five acres. Right, and that's to make a, you know, 200 feet of riprap. But that's not the cost. The cost that the client pays, right? The other cost is, we're destroying the ecology of the lake. So what's that for? When you start putting those costs in the whole picture, gravel beaches are by far the cheapest and by far the best beneficial. It gives you recreation, it gives you ecology, it gives you water quality. Yeah, so we're just not holding people accountable to those other costs. And it's not just on, on lake stuff, it's in everything we do. You know? Yeah. So, so um, I'm gonna push you here a little bit, maybe. Uh, do you have some numbers? Um, how how much does it cost to put in a gravel beach like this one that had a hundred? You thought the yeah. property was maybe a hundred feet of property? Yeah, this uh, this, this one here was about a hundred and fifty dollars a, a foot for that upper piece. Okay. And it can, dollars yeah, but that was like six or eight years ago. Things have gone through the roof now. <laughs> can you, can so you, I would say on average to build a uh, gravel beach, you're probably in the neighborhood of 
$200 to $250 a, a foot. Yeah, and then your long-term maintenance costs come back to how wide you want to make the beach. If you want to make it real narrow and, and ride that thin line through Saturday night Sunday morning, uh, it, it might not work. You might have to bring more material in. And this particular site had a road right to it, but they were going to build their home and that road was then going to not be available anymore. So future re adding more gravel to it would require using a barge or something. And that gets really expensive, really expensive. Do you, do you know uh, how much cost would cost to put in riprap? Riprap probably would have been around eighty-five to a hundred dollars if you could, if Wood Bay Pit would have had the boulders. Otherwise, they'd be going all the way over to. There's a pit in Summers, and there's um, most of the pits in Folsom Bay don't have a lot of boulders. And the cobbles they have are now all going to uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles. But there's trucks every day going out of there. Truck. Yeah, because it's a beautiful rock. Um, so it's, and then of course, what you're going to require, you know, if, uh, some people can do it real cheap, but if you're, you know, like the one we looked at there on the other side, those were big boulders brought in. But they destroyed the whole repairing zone, dug it all out. Heat it all in, did everything you would to make a good riprap, and just started all repairing. So that was a cheap fix. The road went right to it. But look at the cost. So, so, so um, the material cost is might be might be half as much for riprap. I wouldn't go half, but yeah, okay, maybe even less than half. But it depends on where you're at. Yeah, you know, right, if you're right. in, if you're in, but uh, really, if you're up there at Woods Bay to the Big Fork, you need big rocks and a lot of rocks. It's gonna, the costs are going to be closer. If you're in Rollins, why would you build a ripper? So you could build a surface space. <laughs> so um, uh, the riprap has to be stacked, whereas the yeah. gravel just has to sort of be delivered and spread. Are are the labor labor costs to build the riprap higher than the labor costs to spread the gravel? No, it, it, the riprap would probably be a little more expensive when you start adding. And all the um, filter fabrics and things that they need to pay for that. Okay. Okay. So, so when it's all said and done, um, a riprap beach may be two thirds or three quarters the cost of a gravel beach. Gravel beach is still on par on average. average. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to just have that yeah. that feeling of, about what the costs are. Good. Yeah. The cost of the beach is going to depend on the slope is that? of the shoreline, right? Yeah. If it's a steep drop off, you're going to need yep. more fill. Yeah. So where there's more gradual slope, you don't need as much material. The one that you built right. for is a yellow bag with a fairly gradual yep. slope. You didn't need nearly as much material to raise that beach up right. to the perch location in comparison to the lakeside park that you built, right. which is a really, really steep drop off. Exactly. Yeah. So that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the cost would be, you know, if you were trying to do the the, the demo beach at the mile station with riprap, uh, it would probably would have cost more than that gravel beach in that situation. Because you had so much linear so footage. much linear feet, and you had to key in everything, dig it all out, put in, you know, otherwise you'd be constantly pushing those boulders back like as a yellow bag. So, um, that was one of the easiest, and cheapest beaches. Any questions for me? Yeah, it's just things if you have a question and you're online, you can either drop it in the chat or if you have your video on, you can raise your hand and um, I'll call on you. I have a question too. How does this tie in with like federal permitting for the Army Corps FEMA uh, stuff like that? Yeah, you have to do the, what do call the 404 permit. So mm -hmm. all of the, um, all of the uh, federal permits will go first and the county first for those to come in. I mean, your so, helps and everything that you use to help with the permitting, they're widely accepted by the engineers yeah. who look at it. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, the Army Corps of Engineers have been really, really easy to work with. And it's a yeah, when I first graduated and in, in, in my graduate degree, well, actually, Army Corps brought me down to give seminars and, and talk about these equations and how to use them because it was one of the Biggest stopping points, you know, what equation can you use? Mm -hmm. um, and there's been so much work done, especially in Britain and uh, I don't know, Italy, so much work over there, Nova Scotia. So there's a lot of there's a program called X Beach now that they're 
that will be sure. When it deals with the biggest problem we have in gravel beaches is the longshore transport. We don't have a thing. And that is, when I do my design, see that the, the breaking waves there? That angle is uh, you want it to go to zero to reduce the longshore transport. So I try to build the lobe of that outer breaking point. When the waves came, come in, not only do they build and break, but they retract, they yeah. twist. And so you can reduce that angle a lot. Um, a little bit, yeah. And then the, the counties come in in terms of the riparian buffer and, and making sure you build that back up. Um, the state water quality folks come in. Yeah, and Janet Campbell's adding that um, here on the south half of Flathead Lake, there's a CSPP tribal permit. Yes. Part of that. Just yeah. Have that in. Yeah, there's a, a tremendous amount of permits, especially for gravel beaches, because like in Lake County, it says no beaches. <laughs> so you're on that, they have to go to a, uh, um, you know, a, a variance. So it's a much longer process. Yeah, it's a much, a much longer, longer process in, in Lake County. Lake yeah. One of the, the more difficult things in what I, I didn't write that I would like to see go away is this is flooding, this flooding, I mean, especially in Flathead Lake. I mean, you could take all the gravel material, all the, lot, the, the land that was lost in Flathead Lake and put it in the lake, and Flathead Lake would not raise a, a millimeter because it's regulated by law, can't go above it. But you can also start doing the calculations and that there it's it's you know microns on most of these projects how much you would raise raise the, the lake level. So that's a you so get a flood plan. What? You saw to get a flood plan. Yeah, and that's that should be dropped in Flathead Lake, you know. Um those floodplain permits, what they're what they're built for is, is for creeks. When you build a little you can build a little jetty in a creek or a river, and that there's flow resistance to that, and that backs up and then floods. Your neighbors, but that's not the process in lakes. It's just a displacement volume. Yeah. I have a question from Cynthia, and she was wondering uh, where the dynamic beach you put in on Whitefish Lake is, and how that's done, and if you monitored it, and if there's more than one. Dave might be the best one to. I did put one in. I helped. Uh, so I've been working with some engineers that are interested in this and trying to teach them how to de design these beaches. Mm -hmm. um, and with a, a landscape uh, uh, architect that's been really helpful and just on the, and he's the one that's been taking the lead and flat it like, so I come and help him. And he does the design, he says, Mark, will this work? And I say, well, I really want to try this a little bit and I'll try that a little bit. So I haven't been able to there's two of them that have been permitted, right? Yeah, one of, I have a report for one of them, it's that 300 Skiles place. Um, it's between City Beach and Bay Point. Yeah. We don't have any long term. We've been trying to get Kurt to give us some tells us that. So, how are they working? And give us the results. And so, we're just getting back to some of it, it would, you know, I didn't bring any of that because I do a tremendous amount of monitoring. And what we're doing with drone imagery now is just incredible. Um, that would be something that should be added to the regulations when you go to the beach is some sort of monitoring. How are they behaving? You know? I would love to get some funding, bring it to the bio station and say, let's do what Sarah Collins did. And let's look at, let's look at this whole lake and see what the ecolot, you know, let's get some real hard numbers instead of one study. They're doing that a lot out in Seattle and Puget Sound and the natural gravel beaches they're doing are just off the charts with the, the, the diversity of organisms and that come back compared to what seawalls and riprap used to be. And then there's a, some some colleagues I have from Scotland that spend a tremendous amount of time trying to balance the terminus. They kind of get stuff to grow, specific organisms to grow on their on their crop. There's a lot. There's a huge push in this. You type in living shorelines into Google, you'll find a tremendous amount of stuff, especially on the East Coast, being done in this in this regard. Mark, one more question here, please. <laughs> You use the term boulder beach. Yeah. Um, so um, it would be easy for someone maybe who didn't know um, to 
confuse that with riprap. That's true. What's the difference between a boulder beach and riprap? They're actually rocks move when they're in a severe wave of frequent cases. That's why on my equations, they only go up to about eight to 12 inches, you know. And those rocks will be mobile, that beach will adjust and move around during a storm event, whereas a riprap is a static situation. It's going to just stand there and you know, have the biggest storm blows 100 miles an hour for five hours <laughs> and it's going to go anywhere. Yeah, and the, uh, yeah. Army Corps of Engineers, the Hudson formula, and that's why there's such a big difference is engineers, their approach is you build something and then you add a safety factor. Yeah, that's pretty much you know, Make sure, because there's always something you don't even know. Mainly riffraps and stuff fail because there's undermining and then one, one rock will move a little bit and settle and then other ones will begin to settle. Seawalls the same way, they get scoured on the toe and then they just tip over. And they try to use riprap a lot of times to hold that fish in the area close to the oceans. Try to hold them in the, the, the problem is not the waves, it's the sloping and the sloughing of land to the sea. And they're trying to hold it back with a riprap. And that, that one works so well. So, so it, it sounds like to me one of the issues here is that if you're going to have a dynamic beach, whether it be gravel, small gravels, or boulders. They're going to be moving. It's dynamic. They're going to be moving. And you need to have room for those to move. Whereas if you have riprap or concrete, you walk, you don't, you don't need any room. Um, uh, especially a seawall. And so, especially for a seawall, right? right? Zero zero room required for a seawall. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, one of the issues in permitting gravel beaches is to make sure that the permitting process provides for a design that has the room for the gravel or the boulders. Mm -hmm. And that is this issue about moving the shoreline out some distance from, from where from the bank where yes. the person might be. Yes. Well uh, a gravel beach the whole is really not for me my perspective is is to restore the lake shore. Because we lost all of this land, right? And so moving the shoreline out is a good thing because now we're creating a landscape that was lost that has a function ecologically and from a water quality perspective. So you need that. But I also like regulations that don't allow you to build a seawall out there and then fill it all in flat and put more grass because that's going to be detrimental to these things. So you have to have those types of you have to distinguish. They're not the same. We, we have to discourage seawalls and riprap because we're destroying the lake. We just got to come to grips with that. Towns and other agencies have to come to grips. I've been for 40 years, I've been preaching this, and it's never, people just don't understand. Oh, well, cost is a cost. Of, okay, then do all the costs. If you're going to use cost, use them all. And you're going to find out seawalls and riprap are so much more expensive than gravel beaches if that's the, the way to go. Property lines around the lake other than the summer season. Typically, where, where is the property line at the lake? That's, that varies a lot, in my experience. Oh. So, so um, properties that were planted prior to the dam uh -huh. quite often were planted out to low pool. And so, those properties people um, own and are paying taxes on property that's underwater all summer. Um, properties that were planted since the dam, most of them um, are planted at, at the full pool. And then there are these issues of villa sites, which actually have public property that includes the shoreline. And, and, and the actual landowner's property line doesn't even come down to them. So, so there's a variety of issues around, around the lake. So as far as placing all the gravel at the base of the that personal property, that is generally not beyond that property. Well, in most cases, it is. But it's going to cost me. Every one that I've ever dealt with, that's going to be. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah most, most of the properties are so. <laughs> But it makes me think about where is that shoreline now versus where that shoreline was when the property was platted or when yeah. your family bought it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mark documented nine feet of vertical recession in Yellow Bay State Park in one weekend storm. Yeah. Nine feet, right? Yeah. So the make that right? 30 years, we've lost. Yeah, it's incredible. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square feet of property. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. A lot of my career in measuring how much it weighs, <laughs> and sometimes I'm just impressed about it. <laughs> just, it just, just go sailing. Like yeah. Are there other documents that you have to? Um, not that I know about temperature, but water quality is erosion is bad for water quality because that erosion is bringing organics and soils that are rich in nutrients into the lake, right? So, um, yeah, we've been talking about. Beaches versus riffraff. Well, doing nothing is terrible too, because that's actually causing, you know, there's a difference between sediment and soil. And Mark was talking about not having to use washed gravels. Well, that's adding more inorganic sediment to the lake. It's already the bottom's already made of inorganic sediment, right? It's just a few more smaller particles than what's already there. But when the wave action is eroding into the terrestrial habitat, lots of nutrients are coming off into the water. So not addressing that erosion when you have a cut bank is terrible for lake water quality. The beach prevents that erosion and the input of those nutrients, which is good. Another thing the beach does is it provides kind of an intermediate stage between terrestrial and aquatic environments. So you have movement back and forth of organisms and material, right? There's kind of a gradation between land and water. When you put a seawall or riffraff in, you have this hard boundary and barrier between two previously naturally connected ecosystems. And people are putting this you know, literally a concrete wall in between the riparian zone and the aquatic zone. So from the ecological perspective, the beaches are providing more, more opportunities for organisms, especially the aquatic insects, as Marcus mentioned. The beaches are stopping that erosion, which would be causing the input of uh, additional nutrients. Uh, so, and they're really aesthetically much more pleasant than sitting on a pile of giant boulders. And so for us at the station with the demonstration project that Mark did for us, we now have a whole area of our shoreline we never accessed before because it was dense forest up to a steep drop off cut bank. So we always pointed people towards that as our swim beach, but there was no way to access it. There was no beach. Yeah. So like you'd be on the shoreline and you'd jump into waist deep water that was a jungle of boulders. And stuff. Now that we have this beach, we've got this feature, this, this central feature of- From the student cabins down to the commissary. Yeah, it's a beautiful. place for people to Go. engage this wonderful right. lake and hang out there and study yeah. there and read there. And people are sitting there all the time. That was a, 400 feet of our shoreline that no one ever did anything on before and was a cut bank adding nutrient pollution to the lake. And here we are, the biological station trying to <laughs> monitor and protect the lake. Yeah, and and there was a, the cost of materials hauling and placement was 40 grand for that. It was 400 feet. For 400 feet. Yeah, 435 or something, something like that. that. Yeah, so that wasn't any, any of my time. That was probably 10 times that. <laughs> but so another way to kind of think about that gradation of people going from life to it, you know, like my bird. So you're going straight from waterfowl to yeah. songbirds if you're not including your shorebirds, which are my favorite birds. Yeah, I, I had an REZ student uh, do a songbird study on the beaches that we were building in front of our shore. Uh -huh. And when you start incorporating uh, beaches and you start putting shrubs and trees in, the amount of the diversity of songbirds is off the charts. I've blown it. That's I, I think we that study. It was so cool. Yeah, I love to stop on my way home going down the St. Louis line mm -hmm. at that waterfowl point that we go out there and listen to the sores out there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and most of the North Shore is cattails, yeah. and there's like two birds. Yeah. Yeah, red wing and, 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 and uh, yellow wing blackbirds. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. But if you get a log out there and you get a little tree growing, and yeah. ten other mm -hmm. sure. birds. And then at the drawdown, of course, I mean, the shorter. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So Mark, we have a question from Brian, so I'll uh, uh -oh. let him speak to you because you can see him right there too. Hi, Yoda. Well, I have a, a question and a comment. Uh, the question is, uh, you said something about a restriction where you have to use washed gravel. Is that, who has control over that idea? Because in a lake, it uh, does not compute, especially the way these, these dynamic beaches work. Yeah, well, it's actually uh, um, in, the, in the Lake County and Flathead County regulations. Whitefish Lake. Whitefish Lake too. is Because the idea is we don't want to bring in uh, sediments that are contaminated with something. They're usually silts and clays and those types of things and, and depositing that into the lake. So you want to have um, nutrient neutral sediments, if you will. Um, so it's been a 40 year battle, Brian, to get away from washed material. But that adds the cost of a beach through the roof. Uh, you don't have to wash your boulders, but you've got to wash your marbles. You're going to make a beach out of it. So that's got to go. Fine. And I'm really happen. encouraged by this. I'm really encouraged by this because we we really need to move away from the traditional ways of handling with these hard wave breaks, the the riprap. I mean, I've seen this for years where riprap really shows you where the beach used to be or the shoreline used to be because it increases that energy around the rocks and it helps actually disperse the fines under it and around it. And then those fines go out and embed the right. perfectly good gravel beaches right below it. And, and the interstitial spaces in the gravels are so hugely important as security habitat for small fish. I've done enough snorkeling that that shoreline zone is hugely important for young fish. And then the food, the insects that live in it, I've seen many examples and our studies have shown through the years where if you embed that gravel, you really reduce the amount of macrozoa benthos that live there. Whereas if you've got a large surface area with the mixed size cobble to gravel that mixes, that surface layer becomes hugely productive and, and it's indispensable. So I'm really um, encouraged by this work. I hope we can make this transition soon. I do too. And my comment on the, on the uh, being able to use pit run gravel is that we need to get our gravel pits then certified. Go to these pits and say, okay, what do you got here? And what is the phosphorus loading going to be? from this site versus that site. And if they don't come from these sites that, that are certified, then you don't get to use them. The other thing about building gravel beaches is I will never build a gravel beach with gravels that come from floodplains. You know, we're not gonna dig up floodplains and save a beach in Flathead Lake and impact the fisheries in, in the rivers. And so no, no floodplain gravels. I've done two and a half miles of gravel beaches in the lake. And, not a grain of sand has come out of the floodplain, even though they're cheaper. <laughs> it's that cost thing, you know. We're not calculating what we're doing to the Kalispell Valley in the in the, in the Flathead River with these massive uh, gravel pits we have there. Can you go back to that chart that you had with the uh, diameter of the rock? Oh, sure. Yeah. And we can customize that for, for whitefish lake. And not only for the whole lake, but for every little bay mm -hmm. really easily. It, it's not much work. Yeah, I just want to let you know. If you noticed on all of these, uh, yeah, yeah, all of these diagrams, everything's based upon the wind speed at the bottom, because that's something that people can relate to and it drives all the equations into it versus how much fetch you have, which is the, the dotted line. And that takes you through those equations I'll show you to give you these intermediate diameters. And I did not name it the Lorraine dynamic formula. That's actually in the literature. Uh, it's been out for 20 years and now. Um, a lot of work in New Zealand where people refer to the Lorraine formula. And I reformulated it to uh, go to boulder deposits and determine if it's a cyclone, a hurricane deposit, or if it's a tsunami deposit. 
and that's because I didn't show you that the wave, wave period is in the equation, so you can back solve off the wave, wave period. And so then that's using being used now uh, for uh, hazard mapping for tsunamis because tsunamis versus they give you a few hours, maybe days to get away, and a hurricane can give you weeks. And so when you're talking about planning and where you put schools and hospitals and bridges, and these, it's, a, it's a huge deal or condos. <laughs> Brian and I were just out. Um, we went through a tsunami warning. We were sailing our boat down from our nice boat from uh, here in Kingston, and we woke up in the morning to uh, tsunami warnings and fog. I said, "Okay, Brian, I'm gonna put a pot of coffee on. And let's see what happens." Because <laughs> we couldn't go anymore. <laughs> you know, except run up the hill. You know, and they were expecting to have really strong currents and marinas and whatnot. And we didn't get it in Kingston. The fog didn't work because of the tsunami then. I think it's important to note that the technology and the approach is not new, it's just new here, right? Mm -hmm. The coasts and Europe and other countries are way ahead of us on this. Mm -hmm. The soft structures have been used for decades. They've coast proven coast to area. make it through hurricanes better than hard structures. Mm -hmm. Just here in this interior world of Montana, we don't have the connections to the big water. So it's kind of adapting an existing technology from elsewhere to, to here. And a lot of that, as Mark knows, is informing the regulators, informing the public that this is a viable option, and here's why. Right. One of the biggest problems, frustrations I've had in the last 40 years is there's how, how do you how do you maintain the knowledge? You know, and that's by the guidebook. So I'm going to be trying to the next stage now work with both of you guys to put a guidebook together. That you know is okay. Here's a let's say a 10-page booklet that describes how to build beaches and what are the factors, and then how do we condense that into a two-page fold-out or a front and back fold-out? Mm -hmm. And because I think that's that's one way to uh, to preserve the knowledge and keep people going and help the planning committee. I would really say adopt the gravel beach template because it gives you a, a objective way to force the, the clients to determine how bad their erosion problem is instead of just we need big boulders for every place in the planet. You know? That first beach I, or second beach I showed you in your Rollins, that was just a quarter mile from the massive boulders that were three feet high in that other river. I just showed you how out of whack things are. Well, I'm going to give you a lot of credit for talking to about this because I as somebody who is, you know, could be trying to protect their trade secret or their patents, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. That's money out of your pocket. Most people can you know, lean into this and start doing it more with less of a consultation than doing it with some direct person on hands on. And that's less business for you. So you are doing this. Besides, it's your passion. You bring your passions. But that's why I do it. I, I grew up on that. We watched those waves on those beaches. Yeah. That was the beach I grew up on. And the neighbors uh, sold their lake lot. And this guy moved up. And in one summer, he cut down every single tree on the lot. I mean, giant, giant ponderosas, Douglas firs. And it's actually the bottom of Gunderson Creek. And it would, uh, it would emerge on the property. And a little spring brook there. I mean, it was a paradise for these kids growing up. He cut it all down. Filled in the, the, the wetland, built a house on it, and a riprap, and a, a, a seawall, all in one in three months. I, I cry every day. And then my beach wall was washed away, and all these giant trees. And, yeah. Sorry, well, thank you for your dedication to Earth and perpetuity. It's it's very handsome. He's been hammering me, he's been pushing this for 20 years. And his big deal is he's been a huge supporter. Is what's the move beyond the rain? We must have that. <laughs> it's really important when we talk about this. Yeah, you know, if you use this, you get down to there. That's anybody with some engineering, and uh, anybody can use these to design a beach. All the way down to to all those equations are in those graphs. It's all in here. I'm trying to get and the, and wind speed. That's something everybody can relate to. You know, 
You ever been out in, in wind blowing 50 miles an hour? It's hard to stand up. So it hasn't happened. And how long does it, you know, there's some other things that go into that. And you want your beach to be dynamic through various events too, you know, hold up to the severe events, really move around storm events, and then the calm events, there's nothing better. One of the best comments I ever got was uh, Bob Keenan owns property on the North Shore. And he put in a just massive amount of riprap when we were building the Matson property at Beaches. And uh, of course, I'm opposed to it. So I'm writing these letters to every corner saying no more riprap. I didn't know Bob at the time. He's since become a good friend. He calls me up and goes, okay, Lorraine, what are we going to do? He goes, well, well let's, let's build a beach, Bob. He goes, okay, we'll build a beach. And uh, so I went up there and it was. Uh, that 1,200 feet of shoreline, you already had the riprap. I, mean, I told him I wouldn't help him if he didn't take the riprap out. So we took all the riprap out and we built this beach. Didn't have these equations, you know, so I was kind of doing it by the seat of my pants. That's how I live, I think. But nonetheless, um, we built a beach. Bob calls me up during the first storm. He goes, Mark, Mark, listen to this. And you can, you know, when the waves break and then when the backwash goes down, it's that's the coolest sound on the planet. <laughs> I just love this. Look at this, you know. So we've had to sense uh, bring more gravel into that. And it cost him 120 grand to build the beach. And I don't know what it cost him to take the whip back home. So Bob went, went all out to try to do something um, good for the lake because he cares about the lake too. Well, that would probably be good for his property value too, right? There's yeah. a financial benefit to having a protected property with a wonderful new, in this case, you know, gravel beach. beach. And yeah. yeah, we actually engaged some of the real estate agents around here, and I don't remember the number, but when you're comparing a shoreline property with a beach to a shoreline property without a beach, when we win. Mm -hmm. You know, and there is some calculation that they go to determine the, the, the premium, <laughs> the price premium for the amenity up. of the beach. It talks about the business versus the rip wrap. Yeah. yeah. You're increasing your property value and you're going to get it back with that. And why not do it? Right. right. Okay. When I think about Mark and, and a guidebook, like, well, in all things, I think about this. Who's your audience and what's your communication strategy with them, right? And for this, there's probably three or maybe more audiences. There's the shoreline homeowner that's going to look at the pretty pictures and say, I want that. There's the engineers who are going to be able to understand Mark's equation to make a beach. And then there's the regulatory entity who have to understand it to be able to communicate to the constituents why this is good and why that isn't. And so... It's not as easy as let's put together this one guidebook that's going to explain to the world about how these features right. work. It's who's your audience? How's that going? You know, what's your best communication method to impact them with what they're attuned to or looking for? And property values goes a long way with your life. Yeah, the, the nice thing about a, a, some sort of a guidebook is that it will. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, well, that, 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 that's important. So, you know. mm -hmm. Yeah. How these strengths need to be adjusted and have it change, then that means that often too. I don't know. I'm always don't ask me why because I don't I'm always thinking that would be a good measure. Um, paper. That would be a good thesis or something like that. No, you know, there's regulations aren't sexy, but the the sat science and the math is. But you know, you work with enough students that, that you would be a senior project to mm -hmm. do a first draft of some of that. Yep. To get it's so much easier to make changes and raise if you start with something instead of a blank piece of paper. So if somebody just starts out with something, then the regulators can, can do their red light and stuff like that. But other than the cost of money, a lot of PhD students are familiar with the impact equations. We came over here, and what we did is we took cobbles bored out holes in the cobbles, put accelerometers inside oh, them, and then put them back during the storms where we had a, a lot of instruments uh, measuring the waves and the velocities of the waves, and then the, measuring in real time the rocks rolling over and over, which is probably 
So one, two, three. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a beat. So too hard, nobody knows how to use them. Yeah. So um, that's gotta be an app for that. that's why this, this, there is the app. There it is. It's yeah, all yeah. Now. <laughs> so, yeah, one of the one of the issues that with the regulations is it's always how how do you say this is okay to do it this way, but this isn't okay to do it this other way. In other words, if in order to have to grab a beach. We need to move the shoreline out 10 feet. Why can't I move the shoreline out and put the grass? Somehow, right. somehow you have to have to develop the regulations so so that it's okay to move it out with a gravel beach, but it's not necessarily okay to go yeah. move no, it out if you more lawn. Yeah, you have to see lawn. Exactly. You have to, as a as a regulatory agency, say. We are going to restore the ecology and maintain the water quality. That's our number one goal. That's our mission. The beach yeah. has a benefit to the lake. Right. The seawall extended out doesn't. Right. It has a benefit right. to the property and right. its degradation. Right. 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 And so that's what it really does come down to. Right. Right. Exactly. And so you just have to say, this is our mission. And we could restore massive amounts of flathead lead by just having gravel beaches be the preferred alternative. Encouraging people to do that. I guess, like to get a variance in whitefish, one of the criteria is universal public and environmental is part of it, but um, it's like universal public and community benefit. Like building river raft below low water is not going to be environmental or community or public benefit. So that mm -hmm. you would already be missing a part to get a variance to do that. And the, the other thing that's going to happen, and it's, I say I hate to say this, but when zebra mussels and quagga mussels get into Flathead Lake, every single riprap, every single seawall and old docks are going to be have razor edge plants <laughs> uh, growing on them, and the gravel beaches will not. And people are going to say, "Give me a gravel beach," mm -hmm. and then they're camping and being white fish lake and everything else. Somebody's there. Does anybody else? Yeah, I don't have any more questions online. So, um, unless there's anything out here, I'm probably going to go ahead and close the Zoom meeting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I will send out, we did record, so I will be able to send out a, a Zoom link to or a link to the recording if anyone wants to share it with colleagues. So, thanks everyone online for being here and we'll look forward to it. Let me know if you have any questions or need anything else from today.